Good afternoon or possibly good morning, wherever you're listening to us uh, from today. I want to welcome you to another uh, great online educational session we have for you today at Advanced uh, IRA. Uh, today we're going to have a guest, uh, Ravi Gupta of Viking Capital, talking about how you can profit from multifamily real estate. We're going to bring Ravi on here uh, in a few minutes to go over some of the basic terminology that's involved uh, in investing in multifamily real estate, but then also really understanding um, how the profit distributions work, especially from that investor perspective, so that you can understand when you're evaluating a potential deal, you know, what those terms mean. What, what is a waterfall profit, uh, for example, is something we're going to talk about uh, today. Uh, my name is Scott Maurer. I'm the Director of Business Development for Advanta IRA. I've been with the company uh, for a number of years now, uh, focusing primarily the last uh, 10 years or so on really the, the business development side uh, of the company, but I also worked a lot initially when I came on with Advanta and helping people through transactions and certainly processed uh, a number of multifamily investments on behalf of our IRA clients. Um, I'm going to spend a few minutes going over some of the basics of self-directed IRAs uh, for anyone who may be on the call who is unfamiliar uh, with self-directed IRAs. I'll be turning it over to Ravi in, in a few minutes as well. Now, if you're listening live to this presentation, you have any questions as we go through uh, today's presentation, you can type those questions into the question box uh, in GoToWebinar. We'll make sure we get those addressed uh, during the presentation. Uh, if you're listening to the recorded version, certainly take down my contact information. Uh, Ravi will certainly share his as well, uh, so you can reach out to one of us after the presentation is over. A uh, quick disclaimer, uh, Advanta IRA does not provide any investment uh, or legal or tax advice. Uh, the information we provide in our webinars, including that information from our guests, uh, is for educational purposes only. We do not uh, endorse any particular products, any particular investments, so we do encourage all individuals uh, to do your due diligence, consult with your attorneys, accountants, uh, and advisors before entering into any type of an investment, whether it's a multifamily investment or, or a, a, just a single-family rental property. Uh, it is up to you to do your due diligence on those investments. A little bit of background on Advanta IRA. We've been around for almost over 20 years. Uh, and the only thing we do at Advanta is self-directed IRA administration. So we will only hold hold retirement funds and investments into what we consider to be truly alternative assets. Uh, we currently have over $1.3 billion in assets with clients all across the nation. Um, and we've really kind of set ourselves apart in the space uh, in two ways. One is with our customer service uh, that we offer. Um, not only to the uh, individual clients, but also to investment sponsors as well. And that we pair up every client and every investment sponsor with one dedicated account manager who gives them that concierge level service uh, for anything they need regarding their account. We also set ourselves apart with our educational offerings. Today's webinar uh, is yet another extension of what we are committed to doing, and that's providing great speakers, great topics, and a lot of information, not only just about self-directed IRAs, uh, but the different alternative investments are out there that are out there as well. And we do that through our seminars, uh, webinars like today's events. We have live networking events now uh, online as well. And hopefully we look to resume the live lunch and learn events uh, here at some point later this year as well. And you can always watch any webinar, whether you wanna go back and re-listen to today's webinar, or maybe if you missed one a week ago, uh, or a few weeks ago, you can catch that all on our video library on YouTube on our Advanta IRA On Demand channel. So we always record uh, every webinar uh, that we do, uh, place it up there for, for your playback and later reference as you need it. Uh, just to, again, quickly cover a little bit about some of the basics of self-directed IRAs. And for those of you on the call who may not have heard of self-directed IRAs before, want to know what these what they are, essentially a self-directed IRA is a type of retirement account that gives you as the IRA owner, complete control over your funds and the investments you wish to make inside of that IRA. A self-directed IRA does not limit you to those assets that are in the stock market, you know, the mutual funds, the stocks, the bonds, things that people ordinarily would associate with an IRA account. Um, a self-directed IRA allows you to go beyond that and really invest in what we consider, again, to be truly alternative assets that allow you to not only create diversity within your account, uh, but also help you build your retirement wealth at a faster pace. These assets typically, uh, like we're gonna talk about today and then things that Ravi will give us examples of as well, they are assets that are held outside of the stock market. So the roller coaster, the ups and downs that you see in the, the NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange on a daily and weekly and monthly basis, 
these assets are held outside of it, so they're not subject to the same ups and downs necessarily that the stock market has. So again, it allows you to get other diversity into to different types of investments. Um, so the market fluctuations aren't going to impact uh, your returns, hopefully, as much. And again, we're going to talk about some of the returns today that you can get in multifamily real estate. Um, and if these are things you are looking in or looking into, or you're thinking, hey, I might want to take advantage of that type of an investment, you know, you can use your IRA, you can use your old 401k account to make that same investment. And by doing so, you're just simply going to need a self-directed IRA account with Advanta to do that. Self-directed IRAs, uh, typically, uh, again, why are they a good capital source? Uh, so if you maybe if you're an investment sponsor like Ravi or somebody looking to get started, uh, looking for money, why do IRAs provide a good capital source uh, for investors? One, um, for people who are raising capital, for who are looking to, to finance their next deal, IRAs are a good capital source because you can simply go to your existing investors and ask them to reinvest or invest in your next project by using their IRA. And you're showing them just a different way that they could make an investment with you by using their IRA, by using their old 401k. And most people, probably 95% of, of the individuals who have IRAs, who have 401ks, don't know that this is an option um, to self-direct your retirement account and put your money into truly alternative assets. So when you show them a different way to invest with you using their IRA, hopefully you're going to open up uh, some new capital just from that same repeat investor. If you're raising capital, hopefully you're offering a better return than the 1% or 2% that people are getting in a money market or a CD. Uh, you're giving, giving them that better return, uh, especially the individuals who are afraid of stock market corrections uh, and the volatility that they find there. If you're offering them a very consistent and safe and solid return, that can certainly be very, very attractive for them with their IRA as well. Um, I think one of the biggest reasons, especially when we talk about uh, as into the context of what we're doing today with the multifamily and real estate investing, is that when you're raising capital for, for that type of an investment, where the investment is going to be a three, five, maybe even a 10-year term where your money is locked in, a lot of individuals may be more willing to use their IRA account to make that investment because they're not planning on touching their IRA for another 15 or 20 years anyway. So they don't mind having that money locked up for three to five or seven years uh, if needed in a multifamily type investment. Now, when we talk about their personal savings account, their rainy day fund they use uh, in case of job loss or unforeseen health care expenses, that's where people may be more reluctant to use that type of savings account. But for IRAs, for 401ks, that's money that individuals are not touching to their 65, 70 years old. And again, that can be a great source uh, of additional capital. Uh, and lastly, there's no outside approval needed. If you're borrowing money from someone else's IRA or looking for an individual to use their old 401k to invest with you, um, the only approval needed is that individual's decision uh, to make that investment. And it's simply at that point a matter of paperwork to get those assets uh, moved over. Now, when talking about the types of accounts that can be self-directed, um, any type of IRA, uh, whether it's a traditional or Roth IRA account for an individual, or if you're self-employed, you have a small business, you can qualify for a SEP or a simple IRA account. Uh, so the, all any type of IRA can certainly be self-directed. We also offer individual 401k plans for people who are self-employed, who own their own business. Um, that plan just allows for a larger contribution on an annual basis than does a traditional uh, or Roth IRA account. And the other big thing, the one that people miss uh, when it comes to what, what accounts, what monies could I use to self-direct are the former employer plans. You know, the old 401ks, the old 403b plans, those can also be self-directed once you're no longer working for uh, that particular employer. Uh, and getting money moved from one of those accounts uh, is very simple. It's either by doing a transfer or a direct rollover. So if you have an IRA account at a brokerage firm like Fidelity or Schwab, or you have that old 401k from a previous employer, moving the money from that account uh, into an advance of self-directed IRA is a tax-free movement of funds. It's either done, again, via transfer or direct rollover. Uh, and that's the part of the process where at Advanta, we walk you through exactly what steps are needed to get that move money moved over and uh, making sure all the appropriate documents uh, get completed. The process usually takes anywhere from a few days uh, to a few weeks. It just depends on who your other custodian is uh, and what their internal process as well. But again, there's no taxes, no penalties when you move money from another IRA or an old 401k into a self-directed IRA. 
Now, we talked about some of the reasons why self-directed IRAs are a good capital source if you're raising capital. Uh, but for the people who, who have their IRA, it's their IRA account, why are they choosing to self-direct? Why do people decide to take their money from an IRA, from an old 401k, and put it into a self-directed account? Uh, typically, people fit into one of these, one or more of these three boxes. Uh, for some, uh, there's tax benefits. You know, the, the income that's generated from the investment flows back to the IRA on a tax-deferred or tax-free basis. So if someone's in a higher tax bracket as an individual now, they may prefer to make this investment uh, using their IRA so they have no tax consequence uh, to them as an individual. Uh, again, there's a lot of stock market fatigue, the ups and downs in the market. Again, people looking for alternatives, whether it's uh, for their entire account or just looking to, to create some more diversity within their existing IRA. That's another reason people are choosing the self-direct. Uh, and for a lot of individuals, the IRA is simply that new source of capital, that additional source. If you're looking at making an investment in an upcoming real estate syndication, you know, you're looking to see what money do I have? What money could I use to make that investment? Uh, it may be that that money in your IRA, your 401k, gives you that capital uh, that you need for an investment. Uh, so a lot of what we see in Advanta IRA and a lot of our educational offerings that we have are focused on real estate. It, uh, real estate assets probably make up you know, 75, 70 to 75 percent of the assets that we hold on behalf of our clients. And that, those can be more active investments, uh, people buying single family homes uh, for either long term or short term rentals or rehabs where uh, you as the IRA owner, if it's your property, you're going to be a little bit more involved in selecting your tenants and dealing with contractors uh, and having a little, somewhat more of a hands on approach for those types of investments, especially with condos and mobile home parks as well. There are also then more passive investments, the things we're gonna talk about today, you know, assisted living facilities, senior housing, REITs, um, and then the syndications and private placements where your IRA is not buying its own property, your IRA is investing into a much larger project being run by someone uh, who is a general partner who's gonna find the property, manage the property, and you're simply sitting there and having your IRA act as a limited partner for that particular investment. So just to go to a quick study of what it looks like to invest in a multifamily syndication to kind of set the stage uh, for Ravi coming up here in just a moment. Um, in our example here, we have Jane. Uh, Jane has the money inside her IRA. Rocky is the one who has the investment. So Rocky uh, found an apartment complex he wants to buy wants to remodel. He's looking again for probably a three to five year period for all of his investors to contribute their capital, at which point uh, some of them will be paid back and certainly get some payments uh, in the interim as well. Uh, and so for Jane, when making this type of an investment, she's going to review the subscription documents, the, the prospectus that Rocky uh, has that outlines the entire project, the capital that's needed, uh, and the expectations uh, that Rocky hopes to fulfill for all of his individual investors. So Jane has the cash in the IRA, wants to invest in this apartment complex. Uh, her role will be to open up her account, uh, getting money transferred from Vanguard, again, tax-free from IRA to IRA. Uh, and Advanta, we're, again, we're going to help her with that process, so getting the account open, getting that money transferred, uh, and ultimately notifying Jane uh, when those funds arrive. The process uh, in, for the investment, uh, again, Jane's account manager will work with her and work with Rocky to make sure that all of the investment documents, the subscription documents, get completed in the name of the IRA account. So it's, it's important that Jane's IRA is the name for the subscriber and that the tax ID number that's used is our trust tax ID number, not her social. So that's an important, again, an important process, an, impart, an important part of what we do at Advanta to make sure that this is all properly titled. And again, making sure Jane approves of these documents as well. So Jane's gonna need to read through the prospectus, read through the syndication documents and initial off that uh, she is accepting of that particular investment. Now, once the investment is made, we will sign the documents, send the wire out. And going forward, however that prospectus reads, whatever the returns that Rocky is gonna pay back to his investors, that money will come back and be deposited back into Jane's IRA account. So the, the, the account gains coming back into her IRA are not included in her individual income. 
Um, and when that in, in exit, when that IRA, the, the IRA exits the investment or if the investment sells or is repositioned, again, some of the things that we're going to hear from Robbie about in just a minute, the proceeds, again, all come back to her IRA. So Jane has effectively taken her money out of a, the mutual fund market and put it into this investment with Rocky, where she's going to reap the rewards and the benefits uh, from that investment that he has uh, helping to build her retirement account and getting, getting part of her money. Uh, out of, of the, the stock market and in the mutual fund market. So the, again, that's a very quick and short version of self-directed IRAs. Uh, we'd be happy to talk. Anyone has questions, wants to go into more detail, that's a very short overview because I want to spend the rest of the time here today uh, with our guest speaker. Uh, but if you have any questions on that, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, your email, you can throw in a, comment, a question into the question box here as well. Uh, but at this time, I do want to switch everything over to uh, Ravi Gupta of Viking Capital. Um, Ravi is our guest presenter today. He's going to talk about the waterfall profits uh, and other aspects related to investing in multifamily real estate. Uh, Ravi, are you there? Hey, Scott. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. And yeah, your, your slides are up there. Uh, we can see them here. And I would, again, encourage before, Ravi, before you get started, anyone who's listening live, if you have a question about something that I already talked about or certainly something that Ravi's going to cover here, uh, about being an investor in multifamily real estate, get those questions typed into the chat box and we'll make sure that we get those answered uh, as we go forward. But uh, Ravi, I'm going to turn it over to you uh, for you to introduce yourself and, and go forward. Great. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, really appreciate it and, and am honored to be part of this presentation. Um, we've worked with Advanta IRA for several years now, probably a little bit over five years. And we have nothing but good experiences to say about Advanta. Um, we've had several clients work with other self-directed IRA custodians. And um, and I, I can honestly say I'm, I'm, I'm being completely transparent that they, they have been the easiest to work with. Um, and uh, we've had the best success with using them. So, so once again, happy to be here. Um, so let's go ahead and start about uh, discussing waterfalls and investor proceeds. So I'll... Um, uh, before we start, I'll tell you all briefly about myself. Uh, my name is Ravi Gupta. I um, am actually trained as a physician. I was uh, I started working at a hospital system here in Northern Virginia, where I live, back in 2005. And um, over the course of several years, probably seven years, you know, they call it the seven-year itch. Um, and it's not just cliche. I feel like it's it's really true. And some of you may be feeling this in your your careers, but I felt like there's something else out there for me. There's something else um, that I could be doing. And um, I started investing in, in real estate. And I personally invested in some small multifamily deals in Washington, D.C. There are three uh, unit properties. And I lived in one of the unit, rented the other two. Um, and I, we, my wife and I purchased one. We realized it was lucrative. We purchased another one. And we bought another two and it was enough so that we both were able to pull back from our clinical duties. We're, we're both physicians. And um, my, one of my friends approached me and said, Hey, let's take this to the next level. Let's, you know, buy apartment complexes. And, and I was like, well, you're crazy. Cause I can barely manage 11, you know, units on my own. Um, would I have, and I can't imagine uh, in, uh, investing in a hundred unit property. Well, you know, fast forward, um, five, six years, uh, we've invested in 13 separate properties. We're, sponsor, we're, we're the uh, main sponsor on about five of them. Um, we've exited three properties and we've got one that we're closing on very, uh, very soon in DC. And um, we've achieved great successes as being sponsors of a deal. Um, and this is, and I'm going to talk about one aspect of that. And this is something that I, um, wish I knew more of previously when I was thinking about investing in different deals, because I think this would have helped me make a decision to invest with it with a certain sponsor. So the objectives of this discussion are one um, capital preservation is key. I think we all realize that we all know that um, to a certain level, um, but we have to keep that in mind. You don't want to lose your capital profits are number two. Um, I'm going to discuss some of the types of returns that you receive from multifamily syndications, like the waterfall, the promote, the hurdles, I'm gonna discuss that and define those terms, and how to calculate your returns in these different types of assets, and, um, 
and what to look for in a multifamily sponsor and project. So really, I would like you all to have some goals as well. Um, just think about one key takeaway that you could take from this and, and maybe one massive action step that you can take. I think it's important, you know, when you're educating yourself to just to take one action step every time, because otherwise that you kind of lose that education. And, and I certainly value and appreciate your time in listening to this. I'm sure Scott shares the same sentiment. Um, we both know your time is valuable and we want to get, get, give you the most we can out of this uh, presentation. So this is a critical formula. Your attention span is equal to the comfort of your rear end. Um, there, there's no question here. So if you are sitting on a chair like this, you're, pro you're probably already done with this presentation, you're out. But um, I just encourage you to uh, stand up, you know, rub your backside, just get comfortable. You've, you've already listened to, to a nice portion of this presentation. Um, and I've got like maybe another 20 minutes to, to get your attention and then we'll probably be wrapping up. Um, okay, so what is a waterfall distribution? So a waterfall distribution is a method by, by which the capital is distri distributed to the investors. So it's, you know, you look at this picture of a waterfall and it really is exactly that. It's like when you have a, the significant capital, especially when you have a capital event, like a sale at the end, and how all the proceeds are distributed amongst the investors. A really good site, and I, I put a link down here, um, which you can access, but it's called Adventures in CRE. And if you're looking for sort of more advanced Type of modeling, um, you know, there's like LP clawbacks and soft hurdles, hard hurdles, like all the things that we're, we're not going to discuss here. But if you're looking for some really good modeling, they have a free spreadsheet that you can actually download. So you can just click on that link and get that info. And there's a much more information about waterfalls there. Um, the other question is, what is a promote? And a promote is a sponsor share of profit after an asset meets certain benchmarks. And we'll discuss some of these benchmarks as we go. And what is an LP and GP? You'll, you'll hear us using these terms. An LP is a limited partner, and that's usually an I mean, that's an equity partner. That would be you investing in a uh, big multifamily deal. And a GP is a general partner, and it's usually the sponsor on the deal. Yeah, and Robbie, if I can jump in the chat, I want to make yeah. sure two people understand. If if your if your IRA is investing uh, in this type of deal, your IRA is going to be the LP. There shouldn't be any situations in which uh, if you as an individual are the GP. Um, typically then your IRA cannot actually invest in that particular deal. So I uh, just want to make sure yeah. that's clear. We're talking, yeah, we're talking like that example. We had Jane was the LP, Rocky was the GP. Yeah, yes, that's, that's absolutely correct. Okay, and then a preferred return is the investor's profits that are distributed to the LP equity class before GP. So there's, you'll always see this preferred return terminology there, and you should look for it. Um, and it should be the amount that you want for that particular asset. Um, sometimes it's high, and if it's high, that may mean it's a riskier deer, deal. And if it's low, it means it's probably a less risky deal, maybe a class A deal. But that's something to look for. Um, and then we'll just briefly talk about sponsor fees, because this is, this is not part of the promote. These, these are separate fees that are paid on the side. There's always an acquisition fee. And I, some of these are green because those are very common. An acquisition fee can range from two to four percent of uh, the 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 size of the deal. Then there's an asset management fee, which is typically one percent. You'll see a lot of sponsors ask for this, and there's an exit fee, which is one percent typically. And a lot of sponsors will ask for this amount. Now there's there's also a property management fee. This is usually done by a third party. If you have a sponsor that's doing their own property management, just really focus on the uh, um, their experience in property management because it's very difficult to manage your property and be the sponsor at the same time. You don't see a lot of people doing this. It's usually through a third party. Um, and then there's other types of fees. You'll see construction management fees, development fees, and those are less common fees um, unless you're doing a development deal. But if you're just doing like a value add deal, um, the ones in green are the ones you see, the ones in yellow, the property management fees, are the ones third parties charge. Yeah, Ravi, if we can go back to that slide real quick, I got a quick question for you. And again, encourage anyone who's listening live to get their questions asked as well. Um, is it a red flag if, a, if, a, if someone's doing their own property management or is it maybe just, is it people who have less experience getting into 
generally speaking, that do that typically want to do their own property management. I guess that's she said since you said that's kind of something to be aware of. Um, are there you know what are the pros and cons? I guess uh, for people who if, you, sure. if you're looking to make an investment where that sponsor is also doing their own property management. Yeah, so I would say it is a red flag. I would I would look for that. Um, the reason being is because the the managing a property in and of itself is is quite complicated. You have people that you're hiring under you. You're managing the tenants on a day to day basis. And when you really focus on managing the the nitty gritty of a property, it's hard to sometimes step back and look at the 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 asset as a whole. Um, also, you want to make sure that the, the sponsor has that experience. There are some sponsors that start their own property management companies, and it makes sense after you have a certain number of certain like, you know, X amount of assets under management. You're like, okay, well, it makes sense because you keep those fees, and it's another way to generate profits. But um, if you don't have that experience, you're not do, you don't have a lot of properties that you have control over, and you're trying to manage it, and you're, you know, syndicating that, so you're looking for investors, I would really be wary about those types of um, those types of deals. Okay, yeah, that, yeah, great answer. And again, if anyone has questions as we go forward, please type those into the question box. I saw one that popped up, and I'm going to hold that one uh, for a little bit later. But anyone else has questions as we go along, please type them in. Okay, so I'll just go through a couple examples of properties that we actually purchased and and disposed of. This this particular one we exited, um, and this is an interesting story. We um, this was back in 2017. South Atlanta um, in Riverdale. I don't know if m many of you are familiar with that area, but it's it's more of a C-class area, uh, working class population, and there's some rough areas. And in this particular area, um, we put an offer on, it, on the deal, and we were actually number two. Um, and number two is sometimes a, sometimes a good place to be because oftentimes the number one person will put a higher offer than they want and maybe they have offers on multiple properties and then they decide they'll pass on the deal after due diligence or after they get accepted, another LOI accepted. So um, on this particular deal, we put an offer in, we were number two and we were disappointed, but, but uh, we were okay with it at the end. And then next door to this property was a um, condo, it was a fractured condo complex. So it was a condo complex that went bad and there were prostitutes, drug deals. I mean, you name it, all all that stuff was, and it was literally next door. And and in fact, somebody got shot as they were exiting this property. And uh, the person that originally got it was like, "Look, I'm out of here. Like, I, I'm not dealing with this." And then the seller was like, "Who wants it?" And we, you know, we raised our hand. We're like, "Hey, we'll, you know, we'll take it. This is our first deal. We're like, okay, sometimes you gotta settle and do this type of deal." And and we we raised our hand. So we ended up getting it that way. Um, and this picture here is actually the fractured condo complex. We bought the whole property next door in pieces and uh, completely did a massive upgrade and um, sold it as one piece. So it was, a, it was an interesting project. Um, and I went through that because it is, it's a C-class deal and the risks inherent to a C-class deal. And we'll talk about that in a bit. But here's how the returns, the returns were structured. It was a 60-40 split LP to GP. That means 60% of the profits went to the LP, 40% to the GP. There's a 7% preferred return to the LP. That means the limited partner, that means you as the investor, get 7% of your investment. So if you invested 100,000, you get $7,000 annually before the GP gets anything. And during this, the operations of this, prod, this project, we left all the capital in the deal. So we, we hit that 7% fertile. Um, and we gave the, the LP that 7% return, but we didn't take anything as GP because we wanted to keep our capital in the deal. And that's something else to look for. If you have sponsors that are taking their, some of their proceeds out uh, pretty regularly, and then, they're, and then later on they may say, hey, there's a capital call or we need capital for this, or we can't give a distribution because you know, we don't have enough capital, that also raises flags because you want you want them to really focus on the deal. Now they don't have to do that, like per contracts typically, but it is pretty pretty much the standard that I see where most GPs will leave their money in the deal. And remember the fees that we discussed. The GPs get their their um, basically get their profits that way. 
at the beginning. At the end, it's a different picture, and I'll, I'll show you that. So the sale price for this asset was $7 million. The purchase price was $4 million. So that's a $3 million total profit on exit. And then we already distributed, distributed with the 7% preferred return, we distributed a quarter million. So the total profits that we had over the life of the deal, that was two years, was 3.25 million over two years. Um, and the equity raise in this particular deal was 1.5 million. So you take the um, 3.25, you subtract the 1.5 that we had to return the equity of the LP investors, so that leaves 1.75 million in uh, uh, left over. So the way it's split, if you remember, the waterfall is 60/40. So 60% goes to the LP, which is 1 million, and then the annualized return is calculated at 35% because you take that, you take around that 1.05 million, and you divide it by the 1.5 million of total equity, and that over two years is about 35% per year. So it was a great return for the for the LPs. And then as a GP, we got 40% of that, which is 700,000. Um, we did get some fees too. We got an acquisition fee. Though this was our first deal, we didn't charge an exit fee. We didn't charge an asset management fee. And of course there was that third party property management fee that we discussed, but we didn't get that. So we took, we sort of took a haircut in terms of fees on this deal because it was our first deal. We wanted to make sure our investors were comfortable and we gave them a substantial part of the profit on this. Hey, Robbie, I have a quick, quick question for this. Somebody asked uh, just now, popped up and said, "Was is the LP necessary for this deal?" I guess maybe it's, it's uh, you know, some projects. Obviously, there's a lot more money involved than maybe this particular asset. But was it what was the LP necessary for this deal, or is this something maybe if you did it today you would do it without an LP? Just maybe uh, go over that question if you can. Sure. Um, you don't nest if you have the funds. If you have the capital, you don't need an LP really. You can you can sponsor and purchase your own deal yourself. So if we had like 1.5 million in cash sitting there, then we wouldn't necessarily need an LP. When you when you syndicate a deal, that means you sort of make you you parcel it out and allow investors to invest in it. That's when you're requiring LPs to invest because you don't have the capital or the funds up front, or maybe you just don't want to put in a million of your money into a deal. You rather get other investors to put it in and then you get the fees on top of it. So there's little investment if no potentially no investment on your end and you have you get a fee on top. So that's that's how you know those are structured at times. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. And uh just to just to conclude um from that particular example, so C properties are riskier assets, high risk high reward, but also high chance of failure. I mean, that you, know, you mentioned that gunshot and all those types of things. And even at this time in the economy, at this unprecedented time, th that property is probably suffering a little bit more than a, like a B or A class property. Um, you know, definitely watch out for hidden fees, which can add to the sponsor's returns. And watch out for a sponsor taking a promote during operations. I mean, that's not necessarily a wrong thing, but it's not the standard is most don't do that. Um, and then also, our waterfall was very simple. When you have a very complicated waterfall, that, that always offers a higher return to a sponsor. So if you see something that's complicated and you don't understand, it's because the sponsor is getting more money out of that. And um, I will go, next I will go into another uh, example. So if you if you want to get up and stretch and just uh, take a deep breath, um, this will be another 10 minutes maybe, and then we'll be done with the presentation. And this is, this is a different type of asset. It's a class A asset. Um, it's one that we are closing on very shortly, it's located in Washington, DC. And the splits are a little different on this particular one. So the return structure on the Griffin is an 80-20 split LP to GP. Um, the reason why it's 80% to the LP is because it really doesn't cash flow a lot. Class A assets don't cash flow very much on average. Um, so you need to give more to the, the limited partner so they feel like they're they're getting more they're getting more of an annualized return, more cash up front, and they feel more interested in investing in the deal. Um, you'll see a lot of that. Class A deals versus class C, the splits really go towards the limited partner and class A deals. 
Um, it's a 7% preferred return, um, followed by 20% GP catch up, and I'll, I'll define that. And the hurdle is a 25% average annualized return, and then the cash goes 50 50 between LP and GP. And we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. So, what is the catch up that I mentioned earlier? And you'll see this a lot. There's a, there's a GP catch up. And what that is, is when the investor gets their 7%. Uh, uh, money, and th and they hit that that particular hurdle. The GP catches up to the 80-20 ratio, or whatever the ratio is. Um, so just to make the numbers very easy, send, say it's just a 10% preferred return, right? Um, or yeah, say it's a 10% preferred return. The LP gets the 10% preferred return, and it's an 80-20 split. Then the GP has to get their, and you have two more dollars, for example, on that deal. If, it's a ten, if you get $10, there's two more dollars extra. The GP gets those two extra dollars, right? So that, so that makes it like an 80-20 ratio. I didn't get the numbers exactly right, but you catch my drift. It's a, it's a catch up to get to that ratio. And the hurdle is basically, um, a good way to think about it is this waterfall here. You you have to fill up the tank. So you're filling, filling up these buckets until they're filled like the preferred return. And then you get past that, that hurdle and then it goes to the next bucket. So that's basically what a hurdle is. You're just trying to achieve that goal and then you go to the next one. So the purchase price for this asset was 22 million. Um, we're taking a 14 million loan and needed 8 million of equity. So the preferred return on this, this asset is 560,000. Um, in a year. So 7% of 8 million is 560,000. And the project must produce 3.9 million at the end of a seven year period is a seven year hold for the investors to get their full preferred return. Um, now, the, w the, we're projecting this deal to only give you 3.4 million. So as you can see, we're not going to fill the full 7% preferred return, we're going to be short 500,000. So I'll show you, I'll show you how this gets is filled up in just a little bit. This has to be filled up in the proceeds from the sale. Um, the sale projection is 40 million on this asset, and we're gonna we're gonna sell it as a as condos. That's why the sale price goes so so hot, so much higher than the acquisition price. Um, and after paying the loan principal and other costs, it's about 22 million in profits. Um, so you take that 22 million, subtract the 8 million that the investors put in. That's 14 million that's left in profits. Okay, so now we're gonna, we got 14 million. Now we gotta go down this new waterfall that we created and see where the money goes. So we got 14 million. Um, 500,000 is needed, as I mentioned before, to catch up the preferred return. So now that leaves 13.5 million that's remaining. So the investors now have their 7%. That's sitting there in that, in that bucket. They're, they're fully caught up on that 7%. We have 13.5 million. Of that 13.5 million, we've distributed 3.9 million over the life of the deal. That includes that 500K we just gave the investors. And that's a 17, that's 17.4 million in profits that we generated in seven years. Now, the, the hurdle for this one is a 25% annualized return. That means like if you put in 100,000, you get $25,000 of profit. So if you, if the LP hits that 25%, then the profits will split 50-50 after that. So the profits before that are 80-20, but if we hit that 25%, then it goes to 50-50. And the reason we did that is because if we just blow this thing way out of the water, um, we get some of that upside. And that's because, you know, we put that extra time and effort to make it that much better. That's why the sponsor gets a little bit of that, bit of that upside. Um, so the, the profits here as I mentioned, are 17.4 million. At if you take 25% of uh, the first 17.5 million, and remember that's that's 80% because that's what these LPs get of the first 17.5 million. That equals 14 million. So we would have to achieve over 17.5 million in profits to split it 50/50. So with this deal, we're not going to get to that 50/50 point. But if we achieved over 17.5 million, and then we get to that 50-50 point. So we weren't with this projection, the projection that we have, 
we're not going to hit that hurdle. So the conclusions on this particular deal is an A-class property is lower risk, lower reward, um, but there's also a lower chance of failure. So this is where you, you maintain your principle. We discussed that before. You know, your principle is key. You don't want to lose it. These types of deals are, are more enticing that way. Um, most money from Class A properties comes out at the back end. There's not a lot of cash flow up front, and that's where you see a lot coming out. And this is what I mentioned earlier, but just to reiterate, the more complicated the waterfall is, the more it works in favor of the sponsor. So if you see a very complicated waterfall, um, just be a little wary. That's a, that's a red flag. Um, it, it, they're probably trying to manipulate things so they can get more money. Um, so the, the other question is, we, we, I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but I left some uh, links for you. How do you know your deal is a good one? Well, really, the number one thing is to, you have to trust your sponsor. I know so many deals that are good deals, but they have, they have had bad sponsors and they went sideways. Um, good deals, good areas, bad sponsor, it's never going to do well. Um, and maybe if you're lucky and you're in like a, just a boom economy, like I've seen a lot, some of these other uh, deals that I've seen over the past several years, you're, if you're lucky, you know, the economy is going to keep you afloat. But once things go down, um, you're going to get exposed. Right. So you have to, you have to really trust your sponsor. There's a link here to, I have my own podcast. If you click on that link, it's a really good episode about a sponsor that is super trustworthy. He's got like about 3 billion of assets under management in the DC metro area. He's lost, like completely lost a deal where he lost everybody's money and people still invest in him because they believe in him so much. So if you have that much trust in your you know, your investors, you know, you're doing the right thing. So he's, it's a good one to listen to. And then there's another link um, with, uh, it's a Joe Fairless link. He's a, Joe Fairless is another sponsor with Ashcraft Capital. He's, he's a great resource and he's got a, a link there that you should, you should ask your sponsor certain questions. Um, please feel free to email me uh, anytime at the link to our company website. Uh, we're also, we also take, um, interested people and teach them how to do what we're doing and we in fact um, basically help them do exactly as we have done over the past five years so if you're interested in that uh, mdincome.com is a site just to go on that and, and schedule an appointment with myself or my business partner Vikram Raya and we can talk to you um, and discuss with you how you can basically create your own multifamily syndication company and and um, get some passive income flow that way and that's it yeah, Rob, yeah robbie great great presentation we definitely have some questions that popped up for us here during the that we'd like to get to uh so again i'll start going through some of those if anyone who's listening has other questions definitely get them typed in and we'll we have some time to get to them um going back to the the griffin deal the last one you were showing us there the individual asked if this property is going to be turned into condos for sale where would the renovation funds come from in order to get the properties ready for sale so I guess that's, oh, so that's when you're, when you're buying these, that, that comes from the the money you're raising from the uh, LPs? Yeah, that's a great question. So year five, we're, we're actually going to refinance that property um, because currently we have HUD debt on the property, which doesn't allow a condo conversion. So we have to completely ref, ref, refi into a bridge loan. And once we refinance, we're going to take some of those proceeds with refinancing and reinvest it back into the property to get it to condo conversion uh, quality. Um, or condo. A couple, property, rather. Okay. Yeah. Uh, a couple questions relating to the, somebody had a question on the tax filings. And we're going to get in somebody asking a UBIT issue here in a minute. We can all address UBIT here in just a second. But um, someone wanted to know when you're for these different deals you're having, would a 1065 is ultimately completed for the partnership? Uh, and what other tax forms are completed, I guess, on the on your side as a sponsor in these types of deals? Yeah, so for, for the deals that we do, um, there, there's a subscription agreement, a um, uh, there's a PPM, and uh, there, there's an OM. So um, there, there are really three documents that you are looking at, and um, those are the ones you have to complete. As far as other types of tax documents, you 
discuss that with your C CPA, or maybe Scott, you have some insight on that, but we don't really request any of those tax documents, except for a W-9, okay. um, which is pretty simple. Yeah, and I think, yeah, definitely, we've seen in, in the times we've had our, our advance of clients invest in, in all these different kinds of deals, yeah, typically the IRA itself fills out the W-9. Um, and I think, and then typically, I think for the, you know, these, a lot of these deals are set up as partnerships for tax purposes. So um, during the years, I think while someone's investing, they also should be getting, they, you all issue K-1s, correct? Uh, to each individual correct. owner? Okay. Yep, so correct. yeah, the, yep, so the individuals would get a K-1 or in this case, if it's your IRA, your IRA is getting uh, that K-1, doesn't have to pay any tax uh, necessarily on, the, on that income. So um Question, I guess for me is, so when using self-directed funds, can any profit be considered passive income to keep or does it all need to go back to the IRA? Uh, great question. Uh, whenever you use your IRA to make an investment, whether it's into a multifamily deal or, or single family home, the income generated from that investment does need to come back um, into the IRA itself. So it, it doesn't go to you. It has to first come to the IRA since the IRA account is the actual owner of that particular uh, piece of real estate so or that investment so the money does have to at least come to the IRA first if you want to later take a distribution from there from the IRA uh, you can certainly do so um, one question someone says how does the IRA holder avoid UBIT issues when joining a multifamily partnership and uh, just very quickly explain what UBIT is um, UBIT or unrelated business income tax um, applies to an IRA whenever an IRA is invested into a leveraged real estate deal. So even if your IRA is a part owner in a multifamily partnership, if that partnership is using other debt in addition to the capital it's raising from the investors, your IRA uh, actually can be subject to this UBIT tax. And it, it usually how it typically works, a very simplified version, is if the overall project was say 70% leveraged, then that means that 70% of the income back to your IRA uh, is subject to that UBIT tax and your IRA would file a form 990T to do that. Um, so that's something definitely to consider when you're looking at making an investment into a multifamily deal. There are ways to mitigate that. Um, if you are a, a sole proprietor, if you have a side business, um, setting up a solo 401k plan, one of the plans I mentioned early on, um, 401k plans do not pay UBIT on their leveraged income. So that can be a way to mitigate uh, the UBIT and avoid it uh, for your retirement account is to use that solo K. Um, but also another thing, and Ravi, I'll bring you back in on this, this, this question. Somebody asked, can you take advantage of cost segregation to mitigate UBIT? I mean, I know the answer is yes, but maybe you could expound a little bit on that on if you have those any specific numbers necessarily. But what are some of the um, things, whether it's an IRA or somebody investing personally, um, that that you do as a sponsor to help mitigate uh, their tax uh, ramifications up front? Sure. Um, and before I answer that, quick quick question to you, Scott. The the UBIT taxes, you don't always pay those every year, correct? You're, you're potentially subject to those, but you don't have to pay. I, I don't remember paying those. I'm talking about personally out of my personal IRA. Right. No, that's that's correct. So the, the thing with UBIT, and this is goes this goes to this question on cost segregation, um, your IRA, if it is subject to UBIT, your IRA can take deductions for depreciation, cost segregation, um, other things, uh, you know, other whatever other deductions are available. And if you don't have, if you have enough, enough write-offs uh, up front, your IRA may not pay UBIT tax for a few years at least um, before some of those tax benefits go away. And at that point, your IRA uh, may be subject to UBIT. So it's not an automatic thing that you're going to pay every single year. There's definitely other tax considerations that go in to limiting when and even how much UBIT tax uh, you would apply. But again, one of those items, though the question came in, was cost segregation or accelerated depreciation, things like that, where a sponsor may take that up front. Uh, take some advantage of those tax benefits up front, that's going to pass along to your IRA and have UBIT not, not be an issue again, at least for the first few years. Absolutely. And and just to those who aren't aware of what cost segregation is or accelerated depreciation, basically you're, you're taking certain assets like, um, you know, 
your appliances or your water heater or, you know, other, other things that you could depreciate more rapidly and doing that up front when you purchase the property. And, and typically every sponsor um, would take advantage of the, of the cost seg study because you depreciate that up front. It, you get a lot, you get a, you get a write off a lot and you have losses a pretty significant amount of losses up front on the deal, um, which mitigates some of the, the tax consequences that we discussed and it delays some of the taxes. Um, and then also when, when you're, when you're selling the asset, the depreciation recapture is at a lower tax rate. Like I, I believe currently is about 25%. So if your tax bracket is higher than that, then you don't, you're paying a lower, ta- lower amount of taxes with the uh, recapture depreciation recapture. Okay, um, I had another question. Uh, again, anyone who we're running running out here the last few minutes of the webinar, so you have any questions, get those typed in quickly. But um, one question somebody had was on the uh, the fees that are charged by the GP. Um, you know, the acquisition fee, um, the the fee on sale. Uh, do those fees come out prior to the investors getting paid, or maybe if you don't mind running through some of those numbers again? Um, obviously, before, is it happened before the preferred return or before the waterfall split? Just um, wanted to, somebody wanted to get an idea on that of when does the GB, GDP sure. get paid as opposed to the investor? Absolutely. So on the acquisition fee typically gets paid out up front, you know, before anything happens. So and remember, the, the promote is, is separate from the, the fees. The fees are typically taken regardless. Uh, now, that it's usually the deal is usually structured that way. but that being said, that's why, you know, trusting your sponsor is important. If you're not hitting your goals, many sponsors will just not take the fees. So like, for example, if you're not able to hit your um, asset or if you're not able to hit your preferred return, many sponsors will, will just not take the 1% asset management fee. Or if you're not able to, you know, give the, the investor a, a, a adequate payout at the end, you're, you're not hitting your uh, projections, then many many sponsors may just not, you know, may, may not take the exit fee. So those are, those are fees that you can, the sponsors can take out before the LPs get their distribution. Okay. Thank you. The great, great answer. Um, well, I don't, I don't see any other questions popping up at the moment. Again, I would encourage anyone you have any uh, additional questions on the types of returns, um, the different types of pro- properties. I know Ravi mentioned, Class A, Class B, Class C properties, the advantages and disadvantages of those, certainly reach out to him. Um, you know, like Ravi said, I appreciate your, your kind words at the beginning. We have worked with you. Know, a lot of our clients have worked with you uh, for a number of years now, and I know you have a lot of experience uh, in the industry. So Ravi can be a great resource for uh, getting some of those questions answered uh, when it comes to multifamily investing, the, not just the profit distribution, but also maybe just some of the basics uh, of that as well. So um, Ravi, again, want to want to thank you for coming on today. I'm going to pull back the uh, the slides here. Um, but if anyone has any questions, again, you can reach out to me um, here at Advanced IRA when the self on any self directed questions. And again, certainly reach out to Ravi uh, as well on the multifamily. If, and also anyone who's listening live or even listening to a recorded version, if you'd like a copy of the slides presentation, especially some of the links that Ravi had in his presentation. Um, just shoot me a quick email after the presentation. I'll make sure I respond to those uh, and get you back a copy of the slides. Uh, the recording also will be available on our YouTube page within the next few days, and that recording link uh, will be sent out to everyone who registered and participated as well. So, uh, Ravi, thank you again very much for coming on. Absolutely. My pleasure. Happy to be here. And please reach out, as Scott mentioned. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, doesn't matter how simple you may think it is. Uh, I'm, I'm always available. Email is the best way. All right, great. All right, again, Ravi, thank you very much. Again, thank you, everybody, for thank attending you. today. Um, and we look forward to having you at our next event. Bye. Thanks so much.